In the Second World War, Germany was lucky when it surrendered before the Manhattan Project produced a usable atomic bomb. In the end, this project was an arms race against the Reich. What if the bomb came earlier? Which city would have been targeted? It is an intelligent guess to assume that the criteria for selecting a German city would be the same as in the real-world case of Japan. Luckily, we have already started the target selection process, which led to the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. We will use the opportunity and recapitulate the questions we have to ask, in order to find fitting targets for the atomic bombs in Germany. The target must be a German city, and not an occupied Allied city. This criterion seems obvious, but it is not that clear. Of course, the Allies would not drop a nuke on an occupied country like Norway or the Netherlands. However, there was plenty of disputed territory claimed by Germany, but also claimed by other countries. Alsace-Lorraine would be such a case. Therefore, we should consider all territory that belonged to France before the war as off-limits. The same holds for annexed Luxembourg. This rule also applies in the East. The Czechoslovak government in exile was an allied faction, and there even were Czech units fighting. Nuking Czech territory would not be acceptable in any way, and that includes the Sudetenland. Poland is the most complicated case. Of course, none of the territories of Poland in the 1939 borders would be targeted, but already at the Tehran conference, which ended on December 1st, 1943, the topic of new borders for Poland came up. This included a proposal to relieve Germany of Prussia, Posen, Silesia, as well as parts of Pomerania and Brandenburg, and thereby creating modern day's German-Polish border. This is a good argument for dismissing all of today's Polish and Russian territory. For the case of Austria, it more than eagerly joined Germany, and was as much a part of the Third Reich as Berlin. I am quite sure the Allied strategist would not hesitate a second to drop a bomb on one of its cities. This means that the target for an atomic bomb would be on the territory of today's Germany and Austria, whose borders today are just like after the end of the war. On to the next criterion. The target must be in range of the Allied bomber planes. Because of the work we have done in previous videos, we see that range was not an issue in Europe. The B-17, the B-24 and the British Lancaster could reach all targets in the Greater German Reich. In 1944, the P-51 was available for fighter escorts and its range covered all potential targets. But there still was one problem. Nukes like Little Boy and Fat Man were not intended for transportation by the B-17s or B-24s and there was no chance to modify these planes. I want you to guess that if necessary, the Americans would have been able to send some B-29s to Europe. However, this plane historically had its first bomb run in June 1944. Depending on our scenarios, the Americans would have had to grudgingly accept the British Lancaster to do the work. Now that we have looked at the technical details, we can turn to the selection process for the available targets. Here, the following criterion was the most important. The foremost aim is to deal a psychological blow to the enemy. As we have seen in the case of Japan, the primary aim was to show that one plane with one bomb could devastate a whole city. It makes sense to separate the psychological dimension into further points. The size of the target should allow for the utilization of the full effect of the bomb. It would be useless to waste a bomb on a village in a mountain valley. If we look at the first target list in Japan, we see that the population of the targeted city should not be far below 200,000 people. The median of the possible targets was around 280,000 inhabitants. According to the Statistisches Reichsamt, the list of cities with a population above 150,000 in 1939 was, as you can see on this map. For convenience, I'm leaving away the name of the cities for now, but you will see them in the further discussion. The target should be almost untouched. This would make it clear to anyone what a single bomb could do. Obviously, this criteria depends very much on the concrete scenario we will look up. Depending on the timeline, German cities could be absolutely devastated or virtually untouched. We will talk about this later in more detail. The target should have high ideal value for the German people, just as Kyoto had for the Japanese. This criterion is secondary to those before. 
it would be used to rank order the final list of available targets. The city should be of strategic importance. This means it should contain an industrial complex and or military bases. However, as we have seen in the case of Japan in Hiroshima, the industry was on the fringes of the city and not directly destroyed by the atomic bomb. Therefore, this last criterion would be more of a bonus to those before. We have to add another special criteria for Germany. As I said before, the Manhattan Project for the creation of an atomic bomb was, from the point of view of the Americans, an arms race against the Germans. Many exiled German scientists, famously among them Einstein, had feared that the Third Reich was in the process of developing nuclear weapons. Now imagine you win an arms race, deploy the newly developed bomb against your enemy and it does not explode. In the case of Japan, this would not have been that much of a problem, since the Japanese had no atomic program of their own and therefore would have had a hard time to re-engineer the gadget and use it against the original producer. But with Germany, this prospect was much more dangerous. This introduces another criterion. The atomic bomb must not fall into enemy hands under any circumstances. Again, we can provide more detail on this aim. The plane carrying the bomb must not be shot down. This criterion heavily limits the possible targets depending on the alternative history scenario. In times when the Luftwaffe was still standing strong, targeting a city in the interior of Germany would be too risky. Should the bomb be a dud, it should be hard to salvage. If the bomb fails, it should not simply stick out of the ground awaiting salvage. It would be better if it dropped into a body of water like a lake or a river. Colonel Paul Tibbets, who flew the Enola Gay to Hiroshima, drilled his crew so that they could hit the ground within just 25 feet of the bull's eye. 25 feet are less than 8 meters. Hitting a river would be certainly doable. In the case of Little Boy, moisture would actually set off the bomb. The effects of an underwater explosion would not be as powerful as when the bomb detonated above a city as planned, but at least the bomb would be secure. Now that we have determined the criteria to find our targets, we can start looking at our alternative history scenarios. In late 1943, the only Allied troops in continental Europe were in the south of Italy and the Soviets and Germans were still slaughtering each other at the river Dnieper and along the line up to Leningrad. Faced with the prospect of a major invasion in Europe and a bloody fighting all up to Berlin, while no one would know whether the Soviets would outpace the Western Allies, the use of the newly developed atomic bomb would strongly suggest itself. Although in our alternative scenario the Allies have a nuke, there still was heavy fighting in the air over Europe. For example, the Battle of the Ruhr happened in the time from March to July 1943. It led to massive destruction in the area and the Allies suffered heavy casualties. Sending a bomber with a nuke deep into Germany could end in disaster. The Luftwaffe was still able to put up a fight. Remember criterion number 5. Under no circumstances must the Germans lay hand on the bomb. Now let's look at the cities which were big enough with respect to the population size. As stated before we exclude the territories which Germany had occupied. Due to the threat posed by the Luftwaffe, dropping the bomb on a city deep in Germany, Berlin for example, would not be feasible. If the plane was grounded due to a technical defect or because it was shot down, the Allies might face a problem in the form of a nuke. A safety measure would be to keep the warning time for the Germans as short as possible and if the plane got shot down, it should land in an unreachable place. Both problems could be minimized with a target close to the coast. Therefore, the number of targets is very limited. When we look at the list of German cities in this area with a population of at least 150,000, only four cities fulfill this criterion – Hamburg, Bremen, Kiel and Lübeck. All the four cities have the additional advantage of having some bodies of water like harbors or rivers, which could be targeted, such that in the case of a dud, the nuke would simply vanish and nobody even realizing it. The population numbers already tell us which city would be the most attractive target. Hamburg. It was the third largest city in Germany. Just imagine the news sweeping through the Reich that a single bomb wiped out most of Hamburg. And still people are dying. The psychological effect would be devastating. No propaganda could suppress such a story. 
Additionally, there were industrial centers in the city and it was an important harbor for the Kriegsmarine. History supports this thesis. During Operation Gomorrah in July 1943, the Royal Air Force and the US Air Force bombed the city, killing tens of thousands and making hundreds of thousands homeless. Doubtlessly, further bombs would have erased Bremen and Kiel. Both were major harbors for the Kriegsmarine and since the battle in the Atlantic was still ongoing, attractive targets. Even the small Lübeck would create a big psychological effect. It once was the central city of the Hanse and its old buildings would be eradicated easily. In our second scenario, history develops as is known to us, but the development of the atomic bomb is much faster, such that it is available in the first half of 1944. Now the leaders of the Western Allies face a dilemma. Should they have the armies invade France and fight their way to Berlin, losing hundreds of thousands of soldiers in the process, racing against the Soviet troops who had just reconquered Ukraine and are stepping their foot into Romania? Or should they start dropping atomic bombs on German cities instead? I think the answer is clear. Now let us discuss where the bomb would be dropped. The first half of 1944 was the time when air supremacy over Europe switched to the Allies, although the Allied commanders just realized this around June. This does not mean that aerial attacks on cities were unopposed. For example, an attack on Berlin in March with hundreds of bombers and hundreds of fighter escorts could still expect to lose dozens of planes and this clearly contradicts Criterion 5. Under no circumstances must the atomic bomb be lost. Therefore, the plane carrying the nuke would have had to be hidden in a massive attack. We would expect this scenario to look like this. Like with just any other large-scale attack, big fighter formations would enter the airspace above Germany and try to clear out the sky and suppress enemy airfields. Massive bomber formations would follow this sweep. In a fitting distance from the target, the plane with the atomic bomb rises to the necessary height and sets course on its target while the other planes head on to theirs. The two targets should have some distance between them because it would not make sense to risk a fleet of hundreds of bombers to the effects of an experimental weapon. But which city would they hit exactly? At this point in time, major cities, especially in the west of Germany, were already heavily damaged. Most of the big and for military production important cities in the Ruhr were already destroyed to a big part during the Battle of the Ruhr. There was no option left but to penetrate deeper into Germany. Still, the closer to the coast, the better. A big city left on a list with more than half a million inhabitants would be Frankfurt am Main. Historically, on the 22nd of March 1944, the British virtually wiped Frankfurt out of existence. This fits perfectly into our timeline. Frankfurt had the advantage of a river in the middle. If the nuke had been a dud, with the right placement and a little bit of luck, the bomb would have vanished in the mine and no one would have realized it. So my guess would be that the bomber group would attack Hanau close to Frankfurt, while a specialized plane would follow the cover rate and destroy Frankfurt with a nuke. Our third scenario is in 1945. Imagine the Battle of the Bulge just ended. Until now, everyone expected to march into Berlin slowly but surely, but now the Allied command is worrying that Germany might still have resources to fight back. At the Yalta conference, the Western Allies even made major concessions to the Soviets, who already were close to Berlin. In order to minimize further material and diplomatic losses, they decided to use the new and revolutionary weapon. In this scenario, it is easy to locate the potential target for the atomic bomb, since the Allied commanders picked it for us in real history. From the 13th to the 15th of February 1945, they devastated Dresden a yet relatively untouched big city with important industry. If the nuke had been available at this time, Dresden would have been the foremost candidate for the world's first nuclear explosion in anger. At this point, the Allies had so much air superiority that the bomber had hardly any danger of being shot down by the enemy. The pinpoint target would have been the River Elbe, just to secure the bomb. In addition, igniting the revolutionary new weapon in Dresden would have had the advantage of throwing it directly in front of the advancing Russian troops and thereby presenting them with a big warning. Our last scenario can be described as follows. The bomb becomes available like in the real timeline. But due to certain circumstances like a failed or late D-Day, the Allied troops are still out of reach of the German heartland. 
the Soviets may be closer or further away too. In any case, the Allies have an incentive to drop the bomb in August 1945 to end the war more quickly and with less bloodshed on their side. Whatever happened on the ground, the air campaign went on like it did in our timeline. Historically, the war in Europe ended on May 8, 1945. At this point, German cities were devastated. We can use the data of the destruction at the end of the war to pick out cities which were still standing at VE Day. Please keep in mind that calculating a degree of destruction is complicated and heavily depends on the definition. We have two maps available. One is by Hamsen from 1947. Here a bunch of relatively intact cities in Thüringen, Sachsen and Sachsen-Anhalt stand out. Erfurt, Leipzig and Chemnitz are cities big enough for utilizing the full effects of a nuclear attack. We can look at another map by Hohn from 1995. Here Chemnitz is much more destroyed, but Erfurt and Leipzig could still be worth an attack. Additionally, this map includes the city of Halle, which still was quite intact. And another map supports this. The data provided here shows Leipzig, Erfurt and Halle as nearly untouched. For those three, Leipzig is the biggest potential target by a wide margin. Like in Dresden, a lot of refuges were there too. Although it had received some damage, most part of the city was still intact. Therefore, Leipzig is the unlucky winner of this competition. Further bombs would wipe out Halle and Erfurt as well. We lightheartedly discussed strategic bombing and the use of nuclear weapons. Please remember that there is nothing fun about this topic. Do you happen to live in one of the cities we selected as targets or did your grandparents live there? Take a moment and reflect how a nuclear attack would have influenced your life. And now it is your turn. Do you see other potential targets or do you know about another scenario worth studying? Tell me in the comments. So long. Please do not forget to share and like this video and use the subscribe button to get a reminder to come back for more. We'll meet again soon. Stay critical, stay curious, stay free.